Today is January 27, 1996, and I'm speaking with Melvin Raper at his home in Bend, Oregon. We're talking about his experiences with the Shevlin Hickson Company of Bend, Oregon, and the local Bend community. This is tape number 17 of the Shevlin Hickson Oral History Project. My name is Ron Gregory, and the tape belongs to me. Uh, when and where you were born? When and where? Mm -hmm. I was born in 13 miles southwest of Bend, which would be Kiwai Springs Lumber Camp. Okay, 1920. 1920, and Kiowa Lumber Camp was uh, a camp for what company? Shevlin. Shevlin. At that time. Okay. Uh, what were your parents' names? Her name was Audrey. The maiden name was Mill. My father's name was Alma. How you spell, how you spell Alma? A L M A. And his nickname was. Always with the prince of behind slick. Nobody knew him as Alma because Alma's a Alma's a woman's name ordinarily. And so they called him Slick. They called him Slick. And I asked him one time. I says, "How come? Where did you get the name Alma?" And he was named after a racehorse. Okay. Was it a winning racehorse? I don't know. <laughs> There's a lot of them. That's what was my sister's name, and then. There's a lot of Almas around. In fact, we got a good friend here in town right now. We'll go out tomorrow for the Super Bowl, and her name's Alma. Oh, okay. But we're always kidding. How come your dad was named Alma? I says, I do not know. So why'd they call him Slick? Like I told you, on the account of that, uh, working on those skitters and stuff down out of the Hood River. Mm -hmm. And when he'd get through with the job at night, he looked like a grease monkey, you know, and that always had grease all over him. So they called him Slick. That's where his nickname is Slick. He's been, he was that way since he came to Lapine. That's all everybody ever knew him by. Okay. Well, uh, can you tell me something about uh, your folks' occupations or characteristics? You no, know, of course my <clears throat> dad was when he first came into the, well, like you say, Shevlin's, and then from Brooks's until 19. 29 when we moved to town, and that's when he had the service station on 3rd and uh, Greenwood, Technico Station. And then he after left there, of course, that was during the Depression, and he did about anything he did, you know, to get a food on the table. And, and uh, I don't remember what year he went into the Ponderosa Tavern with a fellow by the name of Price Barkley. And they were there for I don't know how many years until he retired. Price Barkley worked for the Shevlin Hickson Company. Okay. See, Price was our <coughs> Price Barkley was probably already into the, and then my dad went in with him. Okay. And then he retired from. Well, from the Ponderosa. How long did your dad work for uh, Shevlin Hickson? Just off the top of my head. Uh, I have no idea. All I know is I was born there, and I know I was out to the Brooks Camp when I was four years old. Okay. I remember that as well as can be. So we know that your dad worked for Shevlin Hickson for at least four years from 1920. Probably four, maybe less than that, because like I say, I don't remember that. All I remember is being out to Brooks's at four years old. Okay. Uh, how was it that your parents came to live in the Bend area? Well, they come from Brooks Camp and in 1929 on the kind of my sister getting ready to go into high school. Did they live in the area, in the Central Oregon area, before they got involved with, you know, Shevlin and Brooks and then into town? Well, he was Hood River. Okay. And my mother had been, as far as I know, foot of Fort Rock when she was, she was working for ZX Ranches at Fort Rock when she was 11, 12 years old. Okay. To see. Uh, I think her mother passed away, and my dad, granddad, on her side moved over into Corvallis and, and Almsville and Shaw. Okay. Uh, and then her brother, uh, when they left Lapine, uh, her brother moved to Corvallis, and that's where I always knew my my uncle of Corvallis. He used to have one of the first grocery stores in Corvallis. What was his name? His name was Hugh Mills. 
Well, were your mother and father born in Oregon? No, my mother was born in Indiana, and my dad was born in Washington, out of Spokane. I think it's Colfax or some place up in that area. Okay. Uh, how many brothers and sisters in your family? What are their names? Well, my oldest sister was named Alma. My brother's name is Clarence, nicknamed Bill, and more or less goes by Bill than he does Clarence. There's two years difference between all of us. I was 20, and he's born in 20. He'd be 18, and my sister would be, what, 16, 1916. So there are three children in the family? Including uh, now, my sister's passed away, and both my folks have passed away, so it's just my brother and myself now. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, as a child, uh, what sort of family activities did you enjoy most? What did I enjoy most? Yeah, doing with the family. Well, Dad worked most of the time and being around the house <laughs> quite a bit and uh, going on the picnics and stuff out to camps, enjoyed camps. And then when I got into town, I got involved in watching sports and stuff. Mm -hmm. My dad was quite a hunter and a fisherman. He was mostly fisherman, but I never did. My brother took after him more than I did because he hunts and fish. He doesn't fish much anymore. He mostly hunts. Did you go on picnics or anything just as a family? Oh, yeah. We always and We went over to the valley an awful lot. We had relations over there. and We'd go over the old Sandy Am Highway, which is McKinsey. Not Sandy Am at that time. It was McKinsey when you had to go, to the, some of the go through the lava fields. Up through the lava fields. And we had to go through Belknap Springs. We stopped at Belknap Springs an awful lot. Yeah, and why did you stop at Belknap Springs? It was a stopping place, and then there was a little, nice little place to have ice cream down the road. There was the old open touring cars, you know, you didn't have any windows. You had old side curtains and this type of stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Freeze during the winter time, and... Uh... What did you do when you went to Corvallis? You visited relatives, you said. I had my mother's brother over there, and I had cousins over there. Uh, yeah. Go over there a lot during the summertime, mostly summertime. We'd always go over there. And then my mother's sister and her husband lived in Salem, and we used to go over there an awful lot to Salem. Go over and stay? Go and stay. At that time, they lived out. Let's see, I was trying to think where they lived most of the time. They lived out close to Almsville. And I can remember going out on the ranch, and they had barns and cows, all this type of stuff. Did you enjoy doing that? Oh yeah. Over there, go over there for the Fourth of July. Like I say, we'd go over there. We'd go on picnics. You have any childhood memories about going over? And oh yeah. Can you relate some to me? Oh, yeah, we take the trips over there. And one time the wheel come off the old Model A and we went from rolling down into the blackberry bushes and had to look for an hour to find the wheel. The car dipped over on one side. I can remember my uncle always milking cars out and, and cows out in the barn and me would be an old slick city boy, you know. As I walked in the barn, he'd take the old cow pit <laughs> Hit you right in the eye from 50 feet. He was that good at it. Yeah. But uh, I see my aunt and uncle. that's over there. Well, they're still in Salem. They're in the rest home now. But they they are uh, they've been married 79 years. Hmm. They're, I, I I think they're the oldest married couple in the state of Oregon, as far as I know. That they're still of, alive. They're still both alive. That amount of years wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. 79 to see because I got a picture here. Well, yeah, let's see if I got it here. I think it's right in here someplace. Uh, uh, were there any family activities that you didn't particularly care uh, to participate in? No, I enjoyed everything as far as the family was concerned. And <clears throat> anybody that knew my dad would have to. He was a character. Okay. <laughs> well, how, why is that? There must be something that comes to mind that recalls well, the him. things he'd do to different people and always pulling jokes on everybody. And Can you give me an example? Yeah. Oh, hell. He'd go 
that picture where you showed him in the Waldorf there, mm -hmm. the bar, and when he'd go out and get a deer, well, if he didn't get a deer, he'd come in and take a, go down to the mark and buy a jackrabbit or something, tie a little horns on it, and then he'd put it back in the ice cooler or the freezer or back there and come on see this big deer i got in fact there's probably an article in the bullet one time mm -hmm. go back there and he had a little jackrat tongue up with a prong horns on it <laughs> okay. uh, something else. well <clears throat> outside of the family uh what sort of childhood activities did you like to participate in with you know when you were out with the other kids and kind of on your own words or something in particular mostly you know, sports okay such as football basketball baseball okay uh, do you ever jump on bicycles and go out riding or never had a, we never had a bicycle okay, okay. <laughs> well, well, yeah. did, didn't grab somebody else's no, no okay when i was i remember when i was in the uh brooks's camp i remember i had a uh, paper route Mm -hmm. I couldn't have been, what, seven, maybe eight years old, something mm -hmm. like that. And you walked around. Walked around and had to, somebody had a wagon. I used to put my papers in the wagon and go around. Sometimes it was summertime, I knew too many papers. I used to drag them along the ground and deliver them that way. Mm -hmm. and this was at Brooks's. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, what kind of responsibilities did you have as a kid? The things that... Uh, I had to do the chores. What, what were the chores? Empty the garbage and chop the wood and this type of stuff. Okay. Uh, anything else that comes to mind besides chopping wood, emptying garbage? Cleaning up around the house. Make My mother was a tidy person, I'll tell you. There wouldn't be any dust on the thing and the dishes were done as soon as the, you just got up on the table and you always helped with everything. Mm -hmm. It wasn't strict or anything like that, but you had to do it. That's what they expected. Yep. That was your part. Yep. Okay. The whole family was that way. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> did you have a way of earning pocket money as a kid? Oh, yeah. Throwing in boxwood and that type of stuff. In boxwood is... <clears throat> you know what boxwood is? I was going to ask you that. No. Okay. That Tell was, me. Uh, boxwood would be the uh, remnants of the, what was taken off of the mills down here and stuff like that when they come in when they had uh, the old stove you know wood stoves and stuff the boxwood was a little like a two by four cut into small <coughs> small pieces and they used to have the horse well at first they had the horse drown thing and they had a uh, how am i going to say this when the stuff was sawed off of the logs and timber before it was made into like siding and stuff that they'd always had pieces left over and it'd drop you into a big thing and come down into a kind of conveyor and it'd drop you into this you know, like a dumpster now was that the box that it dropped into a big box and then they'd have a, a written it was horse drawn everything was horse drawn and then they'd go around and drop these uh, wood off for people that need it for the winter time. And, okay, so that's how I got the name of being boxwood. It wasn't it wasn't wood that would, had come from a box. No, it was it was raw wood that had been dumped into a box. Well, it was wood that was <clears throat> the, the trimmings of uh, before the you know when they made siding and this type of paneling and this type of stuff. Okay, but it was it was finished lumber then. It was finished okay. lumber, most of it. Some of it was no, not always finished. Sometime it would be just. Uh, when they uh, when the sawyers would go and take and cut this way and then some of that bark and stuff would be over to one side you know so <clears throat> did you uh did you do this for a company or did you just no that was just people that <clears throat> people would get boxwood and sometimes they'd want to put it in their garage or something like that so it wouldn't get wet during the winter time or snow like what we got out here and you go throw it in somebody's woodshed or whatever and, in a mad basement, they have little windows open, and, and they use that wood for what? That was wood for for to burn. In their just like cooking stoves or heating stoves. Stove, yeah. Okay. Uh, and did you get paid for doing that? Twenty-five cents, maybe. Okay. Uh, I used to go around and do a lot of yards. Okay. Get twenty-five cents for doing somebody's yard and doing all the equipment around on your hands and knees. And okay. That's the way we got our money. All right. Okay. 
uh, did you contribute to the family income? You didn't have to. Okay. Huh. Okay, so the pocket money was for you. Well, yeah, but it wasn't, in those days, there wasn't much to it. Okay. Uh, where and for how long did you go to school? School? Mm -hmm. I just went through high school only, okay. period. And that was, uh, you went to elementary school where? Elementary was Central School, Allen School, Kenwood School, Bend High School. Okay. And so I graduated in 1938. Okay, and all here in Bend. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what kinds of work have you done as an adult? Well, when we first, when I first left here in <coughs> 19, when did I leave here? 41, 40? Went to work at Boeing's. I worked there until I enlisted in the Navy. What did you do at Boeing? I worked for the hydraulic systems. Uh, making tubing, hydraulic tubing. Okay, 1941. Uh, why did you ha Why did you choose to go to work at Boeing? Well, we, a bunch of us kids wanted to get out of band for a while, so we decided we'd go to this was before the war, you know. Mm -hmm. Couldn't have been much. Well, we were, let's see. Might have been 40 when we went up there because we were working at Boeing when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor okay. on December 7th, 1941. Mm -hmm. And that fellow that I showed you were his grandparents were from Shevlins. He went in first, and then I, he, he entered the Army and Air Force. I joined the Navy in 1942, I think it was. Okay. But, uh, okay, so 1940 or 41, you were, you know, young men, but you didn't have any particular desire to work in the woods here in Bend or in the woods, I was getting tired of working at the grocery stores. Okay. So you were looking when I was when I first got out of high school I went to work for this Greenwood grocery I'm talking about on the corner of Third and Greenwood and at that time it was owned by Harry Twilliger. And the reason I left him because I have to I always had to work Saturdays and Sundays and well, the seven days a week, period. So then I got a job at the Erickson Markets, which was the one over on Columbia, and that was the that was the old matriarch of the Erickson food chain. Carl Erickson. No, this is PA. PA. Okay. He was the old man of the whole bunch. And there was PA, and then Carl and Art were the two boys. Okay. And I worked for him until we decided we was going to go up to. You know, we kind of there was a bunch of us kind of had a little trade school we went to. And, uh, training us to go to either Boeing's or Lockheed. Mm. We took an exam and most of us took, we had a choice of going to Lockheed or Boeing's, most of us decided we wanted to go to Boeing's on the car being in Seattle. Yeah. Well, where did you take this exam? It was just trade school. Here, here on in Bond Street there, oh. where about where the, yeah, let's see, it's on the corner of Minnesota and Bond where they had a little kind of a class going on. It was more or less metal, metalsmith type of work. So you decided in 1940 then that you wanted to kind of broaden well, your horizon. Of us, there was about there was a bunch of band guys went up there at the same time. Okay. Some of them went up and went to the shipyards and some of them, you can see at that time they were trying to supply Britain and stuff with all this stuff and it was so and quite a few of us went to Boeing's, and then some of them went to the shipyards up there, Seattle shipyards. People that you knew here from Bend. Well, yeah, all of us yeah. high school guys that got out of high school and knew everybody since grade school. Looking back on it at that time, uh, did you did you feel like it was pretty good pay uh, from what you could have found in Bend? Well, I think I'm trying to think what I mean. what Boeing's pay was at that time. I don't. I think it was only about eighty-five cents an hour. Mm -hmm. And the top, some of the top guys are only a dollar or something. So you can figure what wages were back in 40. Mm -hmm. Okay. It depend on what what category he's in. He had a, you know, they called what the A, a B, I think it was B, B mechanic, C mechanic, A mechanic. Mm -hmm. My wife, she worked at Boeing. She was, uh, that's where I met her, was up, <coughs> up in the Seattle area. She's from Kirkland. Mm -hmm. 
he worked the drill presses at Boeing's in, after I went into the service. So you were at Boeing from around 1940 or 41 until after the war began then with the United States involved. I came home in 46, came back to Bend. Okay. But while you were at Boeing, uh, during that first part of the... I would say 40 when I went up there. Okay. Uh, and you enlisted in the service when? The 44, early 42. 42, okay. Did you see, did, did the employment at Boeing, did it really increase a lot after the war was, uh, announced or after America got involved in the war? Well, there was quite a few. It was always a big thing. Okay. But you, there were people there that, that you had known from, from Ben. Well, mostly Ben, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. In fact, they had, well, there's a bunch of us, we called it kind of a boarding house. It wasn't a boarding house. It was up on Queen Anne Hill in Seattle, and that's where most of us guys stayed. That's uh, why we got some pictures in here of all of us together, probably. How, how many, just as a rough estimate, how many people from the Bend or Central area do you think that you knew that worked at Boeing? It was a bunch of them. A bunch of them, yeah. 10, 20, 30, you know, all of that or more. You bought them before they got, they might, like I say, there are probably some pictures here of Boeing's in here, you know, guys up there working. And, uh, okay, well, that's all right. Why don't we, yeah. uh, let's see. Okay, here just, here's just some of them. There's one, let's see, and that's just part of the group that uh, stayed in this one boarding house right here. And that's just some of them, and that's mm -hmm. the only part. Yeah. Some of them are probably working that day, but yeah. this was all taken up in Seattle. How about that? Up on Queen Anne Hill. Yeah. Now, were <laughs> most of these people from this area, the Central Oregon? Well, area? I think at this time, I think our folks come up to visit us. Mm. This kid lived next to door to me on Riverfront, and this is his dad, and this is his mother. And, mm. But this is all Boeing stuff here. Mm. Mm -hmm. or, yeah, this is up on Queen Anne. This is my sister and mother. My sister up there. I don't know who these people are. Mm -hmm. This girlfriend. Mm -hmm. That was the Boeing setup. <coughs> I'll just ask you, what do you remember about the Shevlin Hickson Company in general? Uh, whether it was the mail or. Uh, I don't remember. Okay. Nothing about Shevlin too good. Okay. Uh, the only thing I can go and buy is. Uh, when I was talking to Lee, he was talking about Harper Camp. I don't know anything about Harper Camp. He was talking about the left. The only thing I know is where I was born, at Kiowa Spring. That's all I know. Okay. What about the mill? This was a mill town. How come, what kind of influence did Chevlin Hickson have on Bend as a mill town? Oh, Chevlin and Brooks, those are the two. I think Chevlin's come, I don't know if Chevlin's come first or Brooks's. But that was like, what, 19... 17 when they come here? I don't know. Somewhere in that vicinity, but uh, they employed a lot of the people in the area. Well, that's all there was. If you didn't, if you, <coughs> at the time, if you didn't belong to, uh, in other words, I, when I got out of, when I was probably sophomore in high school, I went down to try to get a job just working in the mill yard, you know, what they called cutting weeds, weeding during the summer so they wouldn't have a fire hazard in between their big stockpiles of lumber out you know mm -hmm. you couldn't they wouldn't even hardly hire you unless your folks or your dad or somebody didn't work at the mill they okay, wouldn't so, talk to you already so it was hard to get a job if you were outside uh oh yeah okay. if you weren't associated with in other words if your dad or your uncle or somebody didn't work at the mill you didn't very seldom you didn't get a job during the summer in those kind of jobs well that's interesting to me because see i haven't heard any of that because people i've talked to have have been connected, and I oftentimes ask them, well, how did you get a job with Shevlin? And the answers they give me, well, I don't know, you come around the uh, camp, or you go down to the mill, and you talk to them there, and that's how you get a job. But from what I'm hearing from you now, uh, is uh, it wasn't always easy to get a job at the mill. Well, most of it, like I say, was uh, when they come out here, like I say, when they come here from Minnesota originally, in other words, it was usually father, son, and then <laughs> uncles and this type of stuff. And if you weren't in that part of it, so 
It's like a guy that would be a, say, being a sawyer, that you'd be passed down through the, in other words, like I say, the one I've showed you the picture of, mm -hmm. he was a sawyer, his son was a sawyer. Same way it's another guy that I knew family for years here by the name of Valleys. He was, his dad was a sawyer, and his next son was a sawyer, and all down the line. That's the way it usually went. But like I say, the only time I already went down to apply for a job was to go down and get a job in the summer, like say when I was maybe maybe even a freshman in high school. Okay. And a fellow by the name of uh, Bill Burrell. Of course, this was at Brooks's. And that would have been in about the 30s, mm -hmm. mid-30s. 30, yeah, 30, say 35, 36 or something like that. And he says, well, you're, you got any relations working here? And I said, no, I don't. He said, well, he said, we're just hiring offspring of the, of the mill workers. Okay. And it was probably not the best of times economically. Well, back time. there, the, heck, I can remember my dad at one time before he got into the, uh, after, he must have left the service station because I can remember him, I can remember him going out and working in the field and picking potatoes and his wage for the whole day, maybe even a week, would be a sack of potatoes, a yeah. hundred pound bag of spuds. Yeah. That was the 30s? That was, that was the 30s. Yeah, it's so a depression era. Yeah. Yeah. So that, and that could in part be why. And like you say, we're talking about Erickson's. I would say Erickson, uh, the Erickson family, a P.A. Erickson, Art, and Carl, they, I would say they supported 90% of the people that had anything to do with Brooks's scamming people around town. Gave them credit. And gave him credit, and because and, uh, there wasn't any money. There wasn't any money, and then, like you say, if you might get twenty dollars worth of groceries from it, and then when you got if you got any pay, you'd go up and try to uh, uh, give him five dollars a month. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, and my, I think my sister and my brother, when they first, well, I think my brother was in high school, they worked for Erickson's during the summertime or after school to pay off grocery bills. In other words, that was their wage towards our grocery bill. Mm -hmm. and that was like I say during the Depression. I told her, so you know, anyway, got anything to eat. So uh, even not belonging to Brooks Gammon or Shevlin Hickson. Uh, and this was Eric. Didn't have right. anything to do with them. But, but you as the Raper family could go up and, and kind of get food on credit. Oh yeah, yeah. Because yeah. okay. it just won money. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then that, and like I say, they worked part of it. I think I worked part of it that way too. And when I was a, probably a senior in high school, I can remember working there during the summertime in the vegetable department at Erickson's. That before I, that was before I graduated. And like I say, a lot of that stuff was. And the fellow I, the fellows I have coffee with uptown. They use the same thing that I meant for Erickson's. But, and they never ever, I don't think, well, there's a lot of, well, in fact, the house, my first house my brother bought after he got married was a house that Erickson's had, but they never foreclosed on anybody. I remember then, but a lot of people would have been in trouble around then, I'll tell you. Sounds like it. Well, did you know any of the people that worked in the logging camp uh, as a young person? Well, I knew <clears throat> I knew the Blakeleys, which was this is Brooks now. This is okay. and like I say, that Mac Camel, and, and he's the one that my dad was in the service station business when they first come to town. I can remember him from. I would almost say he was a maintenance man. Well, because when I was four years old, I used to try to get up on the roof with him, and he used to chased me down with a big brush with a bunch of tar on it and he said you're not coming up this ladder but I was only four years old at that time. Mm -hmm. Well as far as you know uh, when the company when Shevlin Hickson first started here uh, where do you suppose the ranks of the, the working people came from? Well, well I would say the original first bunch coming here from Minnesota. That's where the bears come from, the Olson, that mayor that I'm showing you here. That's where they, they were from Frazee and 
the biggest percent of them was from Frazee or Bemidji, Minnesota, and most of them were, I'd say 90% of them at that time were Scandinavian of some kind, either a Swede or a Norwegian, and I don't know if the Germans were involved in that or not. I, I don't know much about the German part of it, but most of them were Scandinavians that come here first. Okay. Or at least had worked for the company back in Minnesota. Back in Minnesota, yeah. Okay. That's where Bill Bear and I'm almost sure Clint Olsen come out of that bunch. Uh, let's see. So you and your family then moved into Bend around 1929. See, my sister was here before that time, but she, I don't remember who she was staying with, but we actually come to 29 because that was going to be her start of high school. Okay. And, and she graduated in 1933, so she would have been, she would have been starting her freshman year in 1929, and that's when we come to town. Okay. Uh, were there bachelors that lived in these logging camps that you oh, know? Yeah. That's what we, and, <clears throat> and they used to have the, what they call a bachelor and they used to, like I say, they lived in what they call bunk houses. In other words, there would be a bunk house of a kind of a, more like those buildings like you have and they'd have a bunch of bachelors all in one little, one little place. Okay. Well, looking back over, you know, over time, uh, what do you suppose the ratio of single bachelor men was to maybe family then? Well, there was an awful lot of uh, families, I know. The families, most of your biggest percent of those houses that you show there, those, those were family houses. I would say the biggest percent of them. Okay. I remember more family houses out at the camps than I do bunk houses. So, being here then during the 1930s uh, in town, your family having moved. Town. What was a typical Friday or Saturday evening like when the loggers came to town? Well, all I can remember the I don't know what the loggers did. They, of course, you had all your taverns on. Of course, Bond Street was known as the Tavern Street, but Jenny for a weekend when the mills weren't operating, everybody would a lot of times come to town and buy their groceries and stuff and pick up their stuff and bring out and I think I can remember folks going to town in their old touring car and we didn't maybe have to stay in camp some of the time I can remember having them just bring back a box of Cracker Jacks was a big treat in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you talk about Bond Street, it was kind of a tavern street. Uh, Loggers patronized those places? That's where they generally hung out. It was over on Wall Street with mostly your, uh, I'd hate to tell you how many taverns there were on Bond Street. I can tell you how many. There was a Superior Cafe, there was a Superior Tavern, there was, uh, it was a Waldorf, there was a Pastime, and next to the, uh, uh, next to Pastime was a liquor store. You come down the street, you got, this is on the one side, this is on the west side of Bond Street. You got the Palace, uh, which was a revised thing from an old theater, and down the street from there, you got the D&D, &D, which is still there, and next to them was the Pine Cone, and next to that was the Ponderosa, and then around the corner was, uh, on Minnesota Avenue, and there was a place called, the name of that, Shamrock. Get on further down towards where the mill was. You had one place down there called the Gateway. So easily ten of them just right close well, there. They were together. all next door to each other. Yeah. And down there where the tracks where Colorado Avenue is down there now, you had one called the Oasis. Mm -hmm. That was a tavern. And, and these Chinese are Chinese the, restaurant. The, well, these these place, places must have patronized to loggers then. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. it never was, was Bond uh, kind of a rough street. I suppose. Well, in earlier days, was, people in those days, everybody was friendlier than they are. It, my mother, when <clears throat> when we lived out on Riverfront, and she was a scaredy cat, nowhere to go, but 
when my dad had the Ponderosa, I can remember her leaving to go up and escort him or, you know, be up there when he got closed up to the tavern to come home, and that would be 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. She, she would walk up there all by herself. Mm -hmm. no, you didn't have to worry about anybody knocking on the head or yeah. scaring you to death. Well, you mentioned you mentioned in the Waldorf there was a little trough in the bar uh, for snooze because guys chewed. With, with, with that many taverns uh, on that particular road, there must have been a lot of snooze on the sidewalk. Okay, you're talking about snooze. If you were out in the woods, you couldn't smoke. Mm -hmm. In fact, my dad and I can remember when back in when I was eight and nine years old, I can remember him smoking cigarettes like anybody else. But when he got out in the woods, everybody chewed Copenhagen, Copenhagen or beech nut. That's all anybody chewed. And I can remember, I can remember later when I this was when I was in high school, and they, we had a tour, of either Shovelin Hickson's or Brooks's. And the guy that was out in the, one of the sheds out there, he had a little trough about like this. Mm -hmm. That was always there was, Copenhagen used to always be tin lids. He had that whole wall all the way around, that whole place that he worked with tin lids of the Copenhagen he chewed over the years that he worked at Sheldon for Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. But like I say, the only one that I knew that most of them had the platoons. But Bill Bear, when he put in the when he put in the stainless steel bar, like I say, it had a little cross in the bottom. Mm. And, and I think that originally it had water, and then they finally got rid of the water, and they put in a little fine sawdust in it, and then they break that out and put in some new every day. But, but most of them was Copenhagen chewers. Well, I just you know it, it seems like again with with that amount of bars that close together and uh, you know especially a friday or saturday night when loggers would have come in from camp you know the young loggers and single guys uh you know and i i, I guess i kind of think of, i i commercial fished out of kodiak for 10 years yeah uh, as a single man and it was the same sort of thing you had you know one place right after another. i don't remember but there probably in the olden days there was a few bars over on the other street over on the Wall Street, but I don't remember which. Well, one of them was uh, Leedy's. That's about where the on Oregon Avenue and Wall, where the uh, uh, that was a big one of the bigger taverns over there. And of course, they had some other bars and stuff. And where the bank is now is uh, down in the well. There used to be a restaurant and stuff down in the basement. It was called the Cop Room. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, was, yeah. that was a big night spot. It's never, you know. Any fights uh, around no, I never saw any fights. Okay. Uh, all right. I mean, uh, if I were a single young man working in a log camp outside of Bend, uh, where would I go to meet women? Well, probably some of them probably in the tavern, and they used to have a lot of dances around. Okay. So like where? Any places? You know, there used to be what they call uh, Cuckoo Ridge, which is south. Uh, let's see, Cuckoo Ridge is out towards uh, Cuckoo Ridge. Care Lakers on the corner of uh, Division and uh, in fact they're getting ready to turn down Division and Highway 97 which is 3rd Street. Well, you know, what was Cuckoo Ridge? No, it was a dance place out, this was out in that area. A, that was the dance halls. Most of the people, I don't know about the loggers, of course, when I was in high school, so everybody on the dances, they went to Terrebonne. Mm -hmm. Just halfway with, you know, Bath Redmond. Mm -hmm. Any brothels in town? Oh, we had a few of those, you bet. Quite a few of them. Where were they located? Some on the main drag, and some on Bond Street, some on Greenwood. There was a couple of them. Most of them are all tore down now, but. The ones on, uh, they had a couple that was probably across from where the Eagles Hall is now. On um, Greenwood. Greenwood, that was Greenwood Avenue, yeah. Okay. Is Greenwood a tough street? No, none of it was a tough street. Everything was, as far as I know, Ben, at that time, I never did see any fights. And like I say, all the years that I was in the tavern business, the only trouble I ever had with it, 
anybody we can get a few many two drinks in them or <clears throat> probably we had up there at the Waldorf when I was there and Bill Bear probably had it at the same time he had the liquor store next door we couldn't sell any liquor all we could sell was beer and wine by the glass you couldn't take anything out they'd go down and buy their booze and then they'd come up and come you couldn't sell any liquor there at the, the Waldorf and liquor was uh, wasn't permitted at that time all you could sell was beer and wine all the liquor had to go with all your whiskeys and stuff above was above eight percent or twelve percent had to go through the liquor store. And it's still the same way. You can't buy. No, no. You can buy liquor over the bar now. But at that time, you all you could sell was a glass of wine or a bottle of beer. And the, the highest percentage that you could sell them was eight hmm. percent. Okay. And most of your beers at that time were uh, probably three point five or four point four four point. Okay. So you couldn't go into any establishment and buy a shot of whiskey. No. no, or uh, bourbon on the rocks, or no, not at that time. No. I'm trying to think when that changed. I don't remember. When, when was that that you're thinking of? Uh, well, I'm talking. We had it in the 50s, 52. You couldn't. I don't remember when they did change it. You could go into a nightclub, <clears throat> but you went to a nightclub. You couldn't go in and buy. In other words, you couldn't come into a bar and say, "Give me a bottle of, give me a so and so." You had to take your own bottle in. Hmm. In other words, you went to a you went to a liquor store and you bought your bottle and you went to a club. You went down there and you checked it under a number, not your name, a number. So when you say I want a bourbon and coke, and the guy says, "Well, what's your number?" and say so and so, he go grab your bottle and pour you a drink out of that. But mm. you still turn around and paid for the drink. Besides, mm. oh, well, that's you, and that was the same way with. Uh, if you belong to the Elks Club, I belonged to, I joined the Elks and what after I got out of the service probably 1946, same way there where the, you had to check your bottle. I couldn't tell you how many servicemen, servicemen were in this area and there was enough that uh, certain parts of the maneuver guys if they were out in the desert they could come to town for the weekends and the other outfit had to stay out and then the next week that was their turn to stay out and the other one would come to town mm -hmm. <clears throat> i can remember my dad when he had the ponderosa on the weekends when the servicemen were in the town i can remember him tapping the keg of beer and never ever shutting it off mm -hmm. just open the spout and the glasses would go over here and fill them up and the place would jam with servicemen mm -hmm. and, I, and i don't know what the uh ratio of how the servicemen got along with the loggers i have no idea because i wasn't here at that time but yeah uh you know now again as a, a timber town mill town uh and this is typical of the industry in the pacific northwest in general uh and it's not meant to be again derogatory but there's commonly known so what's called skid row uh, oh, yeah who, who did then have a skid row or what would you have imagined where the skid row I would say I wouldn't call it skid row but I'd say with most of your loggers and stuff hang hung out on Bond Street on that, Bond that Street. was Bond Street was the tavern that okay and what about Greenwood no there wasn't much there wasn't anything on Greenwood except a couple of the maybe one two three maybe houses of ill repute that's okay. about it and it was you know I don't remember how many there were there was one on Bond Street, I remember. And there was one down on Wall Street, down about where the. Yeah, I was trying to think what the name of that place is now, called Right Point. It's a place down across from the from where the some of the state stuff is. These were houses of ill repute. Yep, that's what they were. Okay. Uh, what about what about boarding houses? Any uh, that uh, yeah, there were some around uh, town accommodated in boarding houses. Yeah, that's what? what they call most some of them boarding houses and bachelors where they stayed. Okay, and any there any was one across from uh, there was a boarding house, kind of a hotel there on uh, Minnesota, about where across from where the fire hall is. Okay. Any, now any, down a little way. Any you suppose girls work at boarding houses? I don't think so, no. Okay. Boarding houses were just where the bachelors 
lived, I think. Okay. Uh, what was the Hippodrome? Do you remember? Hippodrome? Yeah, it was a dance hall. Okay. Uh, that's where... Uh, Hippodrome was originally a roller skating. Hmm. That was down across from where the city hall is now. Where the see who's in there now, Pacific Power and Light. Yeah. That was the big spot. That's where they used to have used to have conventions in there. In fact, that's where I joined the that's where I joined the Eagles during the state convention there. It was a popular place, though. Oh yeah, it was a dance place, and it was where they had brought in big bands once in a while. It was it was a dancing. It was a big spot. It was mainly the Ridney was a skate rink. What about boxing or wrestling matches? Uh, the boxing and wrestling was about, <clears throat> most of that was up in the old, uh, which is going to be revised to a. Uh, what's going to be? It's going to be the youth, Ben Youth Center, the old gymnasium. Well, well, that's where I played basketball and stuff in high school. That was. Do you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Across the library? The big brick building oh, yeah. there? They're yeah. going to be revising it into a... See, that had... Uh, upstairs you had uh, basketball, you had the stage. Uh, down below they had a swimming pool. It was in a... Originally when it was first built back in, what, 1918, 1920, was what it was called Bend Athletic Club. Right, yeah. And that's what they're revising now to be in this new deal, but it's all... That went into part of the school system, and the school system had, and then they, after the Bend High School moved out the other place, they let this place go to pot, so it's, it's down to nothing. But that's where they used to have the boxing and wrestling. That they used to have. And Bend was also known as probably one of the best sports town for baseball. That Bend used to have some real fine baseball teams. Yeah. Yeah, I see a lot of reference to it in the in the papers and yeah. whatnot. Uh, see, how was how was the community have been affected by the Great Depression of the 1930s? Well, nobody had any. You wouldn't call anybody was really rich. I can remember when I was in high school. There's probably a couple of families, and they they were probably getting more their income coming in from back east someplace. But they weren't affiliated. They weren't affiliated with the mills at all. The ones I knew at that time. How were the mills affected by the depression? Well, were they able to they keep people working? Or? Most, of, most of the people worked. Isn't it? I don't think I don't know what their wage scale was. By one very much. I don't know what I don't know what the wage scale was out of camps even. Yeah. But uh, you know, I just you know, the depression with. Uh, Housing starts and construction down, and the national economy being such that it was. Was it that price of housing? You know, heck, I think my folks' house probably only cost them maybe two or three thousand dollars at the yeah. time they bought it, yeah. and it was. And was that during the depression? That was during the depression, yeah. Okay. So things seemed to be operating at the mills pretty much as usual then. The mills, I don't think they ever shut down that I know of. I don't think they ever shut down for, well, later years they shut down for a while for strikes, but mm -hmm. Sheldon and Hickson were the two big, they were the biggies. Okay. I think Sheldon, I think Sheldon, when they originally come to town, they were the big one. And I don't, I don't know if Chubb Brooks would come later, who was here first, I have no idea. Okay. But, well, you mentioned, uh, you know, things were, for a lot of people here in the community, they were pretty tough during the Depression. Oh, yeah. Did you ever hear any, well, did people do any poaching uh, to put meat on the table or anything, to make ends meet at that time, if you know it? Well, I really don't know. I have coffee with a guy, and his, his grandson was a timekeeper or something at Shelvin's, and his dad was a timekeeper down there until... Brooks has bought out Shovelins, and after that, he, uh, I know he's talked about not having any money, mm -hmm. and uh, this grandson of this guy showed you in the picture earlier, they didn't have anything. Now, this friend whose dad was a timekeeper, was that for Shovelin or Brooks? Shovelin. Well, was it Bill Bear? No. Mm -hmm. His name was Deborah. 
dead real thing. Okay. How do you spell that? D e v e r e a u x. But he he doesn't know anything about it. he doesn't know anything about it at all. Okay. He's like me. He doesn't. Okay. Um, you mentioned that you delivered groceries for Erickson to the camp. Can you yeah. tell me a little bit about that? No, like I say, what it was was during the summertime. And I was probably had to be when I was probably a, maybe a freshman and sophomore in high school. So and I worked for Erickson's, and what we do, they had a you know at that time they had a kind of a truck set up, and they'd get their orders. The people would either bring their order in from the week before and what they wanted for the next week, and they put it up and put it up in boxes or whatever it is. And they had when we left the store down here, we had their name on what that was, and that we'd drive to their house and drop it off. And they'd sign for it if they had any money to pay for it. Fine, if they didn't, they would just sign for it. And then when we dropped it off, well, then they in turn would give us an order probably for next week. Okay. And if there's anything in addition to that, well, now that's when at that time I was delivering at the camp at the Pine, mm -hmm. and that's where I knew the makers more or less later. Okay. I knew them before, but that's when I really. Cause like Lee and I were talking, we played basketball against each other. He played for La Pine and I played for Ben when we were in high school. So how long did you work that job? Well, probably probably two years, probably. Okay. I might have done it uh, probably maybe junior or senior because, like I say, my first job after I got out of high school was Greenwood Grocery. Okay. And, uh, the job working with Erickson is making the deliveries out to the. Yeah, I don't even want my way. I don't know if I had a wage. I don't even know have a wage. Or like I say, like my brother was paying off <laughs> our grocery bill that we accumulated back in the 30s, early 30s. Yeah. I can remember going upstairs at, at Erickson's. Where, I was trying to quit on. Well, you know where the Tower Theater is. Where the <laughs> Erickson was right across the street from there, yeah. and they had an upstairs which is the grocery part, and they had an upstairs kind of a thing built out over everything, and they had a, a deal where the charge accounts were. When you pull it out, and here were your, somebody came in and buy something, they'd sign the name, and you'd tear out a ticket and give them one, and you'd put the other. And they used to pull that stuff up. The wall was full of credits. Hmm. Practically 90. In fact, as far as I'm concerned, there wasn't much other, you know, there was a few other grocery stores, but Erickson was the name of it, charged. Yeah. Because they took cash for anybody had cash, but most of it was charge accounts. So this was a job then that you just did on weekends. You didn't do it after school or anything? after school. Oh, okay. Yeah. Summertime. Okay. So it was a job you worked at for a couple of years then. Yeah, I would probably say a couple of years. Like I say, wage. I don't know what kind of wage I had. I couldn't tell you. I think most I was paying off. So I know my brother did, and my sister did. Mm -hmm. My sister worked at Erickson's too. She worked in the bakery part of the Erickson store. Was there, did you notice that there was much movement in the community during the Depression? Did people, you know, things were tough here, so maybe we should go see if we can find some work over in Salem or Portland or? Not that I know of. Most of the people stayed here that I know of. Okay. Close around. Okay. Uh, when did you first hear about the Shevlin Hicks and Company selling? Well, I think it was probably, they were talking about the other day, I think somebody said that it was sold in 52. Okay. Uh, Why Bill Bear ever left Shovelin and come to town, I don't know, but I know, I don't know if he come to town to, I don't know who, if, who he bought the Waldorf from, or as far as I know, he, when he first come to town, he was, he was the Waldorf. And I remember him being out at the camp, and I used to deliver stuff out there when he was a timekeeper. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Now they didn't. They didn't come into town apparently till about 1934, 35. Could have been. I have no idea. Okay. Uh, but as far as the the company closing and whatnot, uh, Brooks had bought them out. Brooks bought them out. Uh, you know, first hear about it in the newspaper or. 
Uh, through word of mouth? Yeah, yeah. Word of mouth was what most of somebody says, well, Brooks was buying out Shevlin. See, Shevlin was on one side of the river and Brooks was on the other. Right. Okay. And, uh, well, that's about it for me, Mr. Raper. Do uh, you have any other recollections that you might like to share or things that I haven't uh, asked that you yeah, think might be important? I guess I was trying to think of something, but... That's about it, as far as I know. Like I say, and then we talking about the taverns and stuff. There was, there was some right across the road from. Uh, there wasn't anything over on the Shelvin side at all on the west side of the river. There wasn't any taverns there, but there was some down, well, right off of where Colorado is now. The railroad tracks. There was a couple places down there, and there was boarding houses down there. In fact, I can remember one tavern had uh, called the Oasis. Was that the name of it? Yeah. Had a tavern there, and they also had a restaurant along with it, and that was one of those deals where you went down, you're going to have booze, you checked your bottle in. See, when you went, when we're talking about these bottle things, when you got ready to go, you say, well, give me my bottle. And then you'd go, and you'd go to the next place, hmm. and you'd check your bottle in there, but you always had to check in the bottle. And when you got a drink, you had to pay for your own booze again. I don't remember what it was, the same way at the Elks Club. About that. And, uh, that's a pretty good deal for the house. Well, that's the only way you could buy it. Huh. Like I remember when the wife and I, when this was getting away from Ben, when the wife and I were up in Seattle one time, we went to a New Year's party, mm -hmm. and it was the same.